Hi everyone, welcome to Food for Thought, the role of nutrition in the gut-brain axis, a virtual webinar delivered by Love Your Gut and Yakult Science by the British Dietetic Association. Thank you all for joining us this very hot afternoon if you're in the UK. The event has been hugely popular with over 1,100 people registered, which is just incredible. And I think that's why it's taking a little while for, for attendees to arrive into the call as well. I'm Dr. Louise Durrant. I'm a, a registered dietitian and science manager at Yakult, and I'll be your host for the session. I'm joined by Dr. Rory Robertson, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at Queen Mary's University of London, and Dr. Kirsten Birding Harold, dietitian and postdoctoral researcher at the APC Microbiome Ireland within University College Cork. Over the next roughly one hour, they're going to share with us what they know about the gut brain axis, the gut microbiota, and the role nutrition has to play within that. So today's event is being delivered by Love Your Gut and Yakult Science by the British Dietetic Association. Love Your Gut, for those of you who don't know, is an initiative of, of Yakult UK in association with several charities, organisations and networks with digestive health. And Love Your Gut has been raising awareness of the importance of gut health for over 22 years through expert tips, recipes, digestive health news and more. And every September, every year, they host Love Your Gut Week as an opportunity to really drive awareness around gut health. There's also dedicated resources on the Love Your Gut website. Some are specifically for healthcare professionals too. So we would really encourage you to have a look at the website, loveyourgut.com yourselves and see if it's a possible tool that you could use or a resource for yourselves, but also for your patients. At Yakult, we're a science-based company dedicated to understanding the science behind our gut bacteria. And within the science department, we particularly focus on supporting healthcare professionals understanding and knowledge of the gut microbiota. And in a recent survey conducted by Yakult, we found that about 92% of people refer to their gut when talking about their feelings, but almost half don't know that there's a real connection between our gut and our brain and only 29% have ever heard of the gut-brain axis. So as a company and as a science department, we're on a bit of a mission to support and educate everyone to learn a bit more about the gut-brain axis and the role that nutrition may have to play, which is why this, this webinar is being hosted today. Here's the programme for the session today. So we have Dr. Rory Robertson starting us off with an introduction to the, the microbiota and the gut-brain axis followed by Dr. Kirsten Burning harold really delving into the role that nutrition may have to play in sharing with us some of the latest research. Throughout this event, you're welcome and encouraged to ask questions. Uh, we ask that you do so via the Q&A box and we can keep an eye on the questions that are coming in. And we've dedicated some time after each speaker to put those questions to them. Um, hopefully we're recording this event, so we will share a link with you. Give us some time to get that, that ready to share with you. Um, but hopefully it's being recorded and you will all get a link so you can view it again at a later date. So without further ado, let's get started. First up, we have Dr. Rory Robertson. Rory obtained a, a BSc in human nutrition from the University College Dublin and subsequently conducted a PhD in microbiology within the APC Microbiome Institute. Let me stop sharing my screen and you can start sharing yours, Rory. Great, thanks very much, Louise. So Rory is, uh, I said, he's, he's conducted a PhD in microbiology within the APC Microbiome Institute in Ireland, and um, he currently works as a postdoctoral research fellow in the Blizzard Institute at Qu Queen Mary's University of London, where his research examines the influence of the gut microbiome in early life growth and infection with large mother infant cohorts in sub-Saharan Africa. He's done some fantastic TED Talks on the gut-brain axis, before, uh, which is why we were really interested in getting him here to, to tell us um, a bit about what he knows. He's going to be giving us our, our introductory session to the gut microbiota and the gut brain access with his talk titled Bellies, Bugs and Brains. So your slides are all up, looking great. I'll hand over to you um, and say thank you in advance. Thanks very much, Louise. And hi, everyone who's joining in on this uh, hot day for those who are in the UK. Um, so yes, I'm a, a nutritionist uh, by training uh, and I have a PhD in microbiology. So I research day to day uh, the role of the gut microbiome uh, in, uh, in our health in, in a variety of different ways uh, and somewhat how, how our diet kind of interacts with that. Kirsten is gonna give you a little more detail later on about uh, diet specifically and nutrition and the gut microbiome, but I'm here today to give you the the basics of, of the gut microbiome, but particularly the, the gut brain axis 
and how this uh, science is evolving really rapidly over the last few years uh, to show us the evidence of how the gut and the brain are linked um, in a variety of ways. So I, I'm sure a majority of you are dietitians or nutritionists or are somewhat involved in the clinical field of, um, of, of gut health. And, but usually the public aren't really aware when we talk about the gut, what, what you're talking about. Uh, it's, it can be used either for the whole gastrointestinal tract, it could be used for the whole gastrointestinal system, or it could be used just looking at the intestines. I think it's appropriate that we refer to the gut when we're talking just about the, the intestines, the lower and, and the large intestine. And the gut then makes up a, a larger um, proportion of the gastrointestinal tract, which would, I suppose, count the tube from your mouth all the way out the other end, uh, which then also makes up a larger part of the gastrointestinal system, which uh, would include our liver, which include our pancreas and some of these other organs which are involved in digestion. And previously, um, the, the gut was just seen as a transport tube um, and, and really seen as a kind of, not quite a redundant organ, but just a transport system uh, that allows us to digest food uh, and to excrete waste. But the fascinating science over the last few years shows that this really is an active functional organ that plays a huge amount of roles uh, throughout our body and not just for gut health itself. So I want to break down uh, the gut-brain axis and kind of go back to basics about um, gut physiology, uh, what the, the gut does, what we, what we know it does historically and what we've learned it does in the last few years, uh, to talk about the basics of the brain and how the brain works, and then finally uh, the axis, how, how these two organs are connected uh, and how we've, we've learned about this um, gut-brain axis per se in the last few years. So starting with the gut, I, I'd love to go back to, to basics. And uh, we might remember this from um, high school or, or secondary school biology and learning about the gastrointestinal system. But a, a lot of what we were taught uh, even five, 10 years ago um, is, is now a bit old and we've, we've learned so much more uh, in recent years. So we know that the gut is uh, the primary site for nutrient absorption. Everything that we consume on a day-to-day -day basis um, will either be passed from the gut lumen and into our bloodstream and, and passed around our body, or it'll be excreted. So the gut is really important for determining uh, our nutritional status and what we absorb and what we excrete. And this is mainly driven, um, or is partially driven as well, um, by a number of factors, including the enzymes that are present in the different regions of the gut, and also the pH gradient that's there. So in the stomach, we have a very acidic environment. There's a very low pH, and this helps with the breakdown of um, different nutrients. The pH then becomes more alkaline as you move into the um, small intestine. It almost becomes a neutral pH as you move to the end of the, the small intestine, and then becomes a bit more acidic again in the large intestine. They're kind of the basics of, of gut function that we know. But in recent years, uh, we've learned so much more. So uh, a figure you might have heard in recent times is that 70% of the immune system uh, is, is based in your gut. That's a, a fairly rough um, figure, but it's based on the fact that 70% of what's called mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue is based in our gut. So if you break that down, we have lymph all around our body, which is this fluid that helps move immune cells to different parts of our body. And when that is uh, close to our mucosal surfaces, that would be our mouth, our gut, our lungs, anywhere that there's an entry to a body, uh, these are called uh, mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues. Well, you add up all of that, 70% of that mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue of our body is located in our gut. So that is, is incredible to think that as a huge proportion of our immunity is located in our intestines. And it, it, it's somewhat um, normal to think because everything that's passed, you know, everything we consume has to uh, pass through our gut. So all of the food, all of the drink, most of the medicines that we consume um, pass through this site. And so our immune system really needs to know uh, and be prepared to allow the good things in and to excrete the bad things. 
as well as being the center point of our immune system, there's also a, a huge amount of hormone production in the gut as well. The gut is a really active endocrine organ. We know that other endocrine organs around the body produce other hormones, but, but so does the gut. And that has been um, downplayed and kind of forgotten about until recently. A number of really fascinating cells in the gut called enteroendocrine cells produce hormones such as CCK, GLP-1, 5-HT, which is the, um, the kind of chemical name for serotonin. Uh, and that shows us that the gut doesn't just absorb nutrients and it doesn't just excrete weight, uh, waste. It actually produces hormones which play a role in our satiety, in our hunger, in our digestion, and in the the functioning of, of so many uh, pathways throughout the body. As well as hormones, uh, the gut produces a huge number of enzymes uh, and proteins called antimicrobial peptides, which are involved in fighting off infection. And finally, the gut is what's known as an ecological niche or a, a suitable environment for our gut microbiome, which I'll, I'll move on to in a minute. It is the perfect, dark, warm, nutrient-rich environment, um, which lacks oxygen, which is very important for a lot of bacteria, uh, for our microbiome to grow and to thrive. So if we look at kind of the, the, some of the details of this, uh, what's happening in the gut, you can see some of these uh, processes in play. These pink cells here um, are, make up what's called the epithelial barrier. Uh, and so this is the one layer of cells uh, at your, uh, in your gut uh, through which nutrients will pass through into your bloodstream uh, and which creates a barrier to prevent toxins or harmful bacteria from passing through into your bloodstream. So these pink cells, known as epithelial cells, provide a, an important barrier, but they're also interspersed by some of these other interesting gut cells that I've mentioned. For example, enteroendocrine cells, which produce some of these important hormones. And on top of this barrier of intestinal cells, we have mucus. And mucus uh, is mucus. It, it kind of provides a kind of a thick gradient to prevent, again, disease-causing bacteria from passing through into our bloodstream, and so provides an extra layer of protection for our gut. But it also is home to a lot of beneficial bacteria, uh, uh, known collectively as our microbiome, which I'll move on to. If we look below the pink cells, uh, just kind of behind the epithelial barrier, we have all these fascinating immune cells. So this is the 70% of your immune system, which all lie just underneath uh, your gut bacteria, uh, your gut barrier. And some fascinating immune cells, for example, dendritic cells here, they can even pass an arm through the, the bacteria, the gut barrier to taste bacteria in the lumen and to check what they should allow into the body and what they should be excreting. So that is the kind of the, the basics and a bit of detail about how our gut works. Um, but that is the gut itself. And, and until recently, we hadn't considered uh, the role of all the normal healthy bacteria that are within the gut. For years, doctors, scientists considered that most bacteria, viruses and fungi cause disease and we should try and get rid of them from, from our body completely. But we've realized that that is not the case. And actually, the trillions of microbes inside of us are actually really fundamental to not only the health of our gut, but the health of our entire body. And so we need to think of this a bit like an ecosystem. If I were to ask you to picture an ecosystem, you might say the Amazon rainforest, you might say the Great Barrier Reef, uh, like here. And in any of these ecosystems, the health of the ecosystem relies on the diversity of species that are within it. So for example, in a coral reef, if you have an overabundance of one type of fish or an overabundance of, of algae, as we see with global warming in the, global barrier reef, in the Great Barrier Reef, um, we see that the health of the overall ecosystem tends to decline. The, the health of an ecosystem relies on the competition, the com competition for space and for food and the interaction between all of these different species. And that is exactly what is happening in your gut as well. Your gut is an ecosystem of uh, hidden organisms, microscopic organisms, including bacteria, funguses, uh, fungi, viruses. 
And these all rely on the interaction with each other uh, where they compete for space, for food, they provide food for each other uh, and they interact with your, your gut cells and your immune cells as well. So collectively, all of these microbes that are living on your body uh, is known as your, the human microbiome, but most of these are, are located in your gut because it is this uh, perfect environment for microbes to grow. And to really get a grasp of how diverse and how large this microbial organ is, if we take a rough count uh, of the number of cells that are in the human body, there are very roughly 30 trillion uh, human cells in your body. If we count up just the bacterial cells in your body, we're outnumbered. There's roughly 40 trillion bacterial cells in your body. That does not even include the number of viruses or other microbes that are, are 10, 100 times, even 1,000 times more. Genetically, we're even less human. There are 23,000 genes in the human genome. There are at least 200 genes uh, within the human microbiome. We are less than 1% genetically human. So this is fascinating to think for years, we never considered uh, the, the importance or the role of all these microbial genes uh, in our body's health and our, our body's disease. So we have this big microbial organ inside of us. However, unfortunately today, it's quite hard to determine what a healthy microbiome is. And that's mainly because we all have different microbiomes, depending on who we live with, depending on how we grew up, depending on where we live in the world. So if anyone asks you what is a healthy microbiome, the only kind of consistent marker that we can say right now is uh, indicative of a healthy gut microbiome is high diversity. Like these other ecosystems, we want lots of different species there because they all have different functions for your body. So it's been consistently shown in human studies that high diversity of the gut microbiome uh, is, is a good marker of, of health. Now in humans, uh, the, the gut microbiome is mainly made up of uh, species or types of bacteria such as firmicutes and bacteroidetes, but it also includes things like proteobacteria, actinobacteria, which are way more common in, in babies. Uh, and if we look at the, the patterns of these different um, types of microbes, we can get some idea of, of health uh, in, in certain cohorts. So this has only mainly been studied in, in kind of the US and the UK and in very industrialized, westernized populations. If we look at that and, and we look at enterotypes of the gut microbiomes, that means certain groups or patterns of gut microbiomes, we know that uh, a, a enterotype that is high in these types of microbes uh, called bacteroides, that has been consistently associated with higher BMI or higher weight Whereas those with more ruminoc ruminococcaceae, which are a type of bacteria which digest fiber, that is more associated with normal weight and, and normal metabolic health. However, um, it, the, the function of these microbes may actually in the future be able to tell us a little bit more uh, than just looking at the types of bacteria as well. So if we consider their ability to produce certain vitamins, their ability to break down carbohydrates or produce amino acids, for example, that can tell us a little bit more about how healthy a microbiome is and therefore how healthy a, a person is or how at risk of disease they are. And so our gut microbiomes differ uh, across countries and uh, across different settings, but they're all also very, very personal as well. Humans are very similar to each other genetically, but they're way more different to each other um, depending on their gut microbiome. And a fascinating study showed this uh, a few years ago, whereby our blood sugar is determined a lot by the composition uh, of our gut microbiome. So this was one participant in a human study uh, who were fed either bananas or cookies. And everyone involved in uh, dietetics or nutrition here will know that we, it's not a great thing to have a very, very large and sustained sugar spike after a meal. So this participant, interestingly, had a large uh, sugar spike after eating bananas, uh, but no uh, real sugar spike after eating cookies. Whereas this other participant had a huge sugar spike after eating cookies, but no uh, real spike after eating a banana. So we all have these differences in our ability to digest nutrients. 
And uh, it's been shown through this recent evidence that a lot of this might be determined by the composition of our gut microbiome. So these scientists then profiled the gut microbiome of a thousand people, looked at their responses to different foods, and then created personalized diets based on their gut microbiome and other factors, and found that they were able to create personalized diets that were better at controlling people's blood sugar uh, than just your standard uh, national guidelines. So that just shows us that our gut microbiomes are very personalized and may play a big role in nutrition uh, and how we respond to, to different foods. And so the future of um, nutrition may come from profiling our gut microbiome and from um, focusing on personalized nutrition. That is the basics of the gut and, and the gut microbiome. So we're going to move up the body then and, and look at the brain and kind of look back at the, the basic physiology of the brain and, and go back to, to school and, um, and talk about how the brain works. So the brain makes up a, a central part of what is known as the, the central nervous system, uh, which would include the brain and the spinal cord. And the function of the, of the central nervous system is largely defined by uh, neurons or nerves. And in the brain, we have 100 billion neurons. And in the spinal cord, there's about 100 million neurons. We have this really uh, active electrochemical uh, organ sitting in our heads, which controls uh, the function of the rest of the, um, our body. However, as you'll see on the right here, uh, the central nervous system connects to what is known as the peripheral nervous system. And so that is all the nerves and the neurons that are connected from the spinal cord and the brain to the rest of the body. And so these are known as the, the peripheral nervous system, these nerves that connect to all of your other organs. And interestingly, uh, the gut is a central part of this peripheral nervous system. In fact, the gut uh, has 500 million neurons in it. And this makes up what's known as the enteric nervous system, or the nervous system of the gut. Intriguingly, it even has more nerves than the spinal cord itself. So the gut is a really um, active part of your nervous system, which makes up part of the larger, um, sorry, which makes up part of the larger nervous system. So the, the peripheral and the central nervous system work mainly by uh, electrical signaling throughout the body. Your brain sends messages through all of these nerves and neurons to the different organs, uh, but also it can send biochemical messages through the blood by producing different neurotransmitters, hormones, and other um, compounds which are, are passed to, to the rest of your body. And it is protective, protected, just like the gut, with a, a barrier uh, known as the blood-brain barrier, um, which can allow certain compounds to pass from your body into your brain and vice versa, but also protect your brain from, um, from toxins and, and various things passing into it. However, for years, uh, we've, we've kind of forgotten that uh, the brain uh, can have a, a, a really substantial impact on your physiology, uh, on, on how you feel, uh, on the function of, of the rest of your body, uh, and, and really psychology plays a big role in, uh, in how the rest of our, our body works. So this um, is really demonstrated from this uh, recent large um, clinical trial here. And this here is the um, side effects that were reported uh, from this clinical trial. And if we didn't have so many people, I'd ask people if they wanted to guess what, what was provided in this clinical trial to induce these side effects in people. Um, a third of people reported fatigue, uh, a third of people reported headache, 10% uh, of people or more, 12% of people reported diarrhea. So this was actually the placebo arm of the Pfizer COVID uh, vaccine uh, trial. And all this demonstrates to us is that our brain can have a huge influence over the, our, our functioning of the rest of our body, what we feel, uh, and the, the physiological effects uh, in our body. People that got only a, a water in their arm um, reported diarrhea, reported fatigue, reported chills. So that shows that our brain can have a huge effect on, um, on, on not only how our gut functions, as we see here with the diarrhea, but how the rest of our, our body works as well. So how are these two uh, organs connected? How do the gut and, and its microbiome uh, signal to the brain uh, and vice versa? Well, we have some evidence for this uh, in the animal kingdom uh, before we get to humans. 
So this is a, a photo that, that I took a few years ago um, from an ant that was recovered underneath the soil. And I was uh, told by the, the person that dug this ant up um, that this happens when uh, this ant becomes infected with a microbe, with a, a parasite known as Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. So this microbe, when it um, colonizes this ant, it completely changes the behavior of the ant and it leads the ant to crawl underneath the soil uh, and to die so that this parasite can then grow uh, into the fungus that you see here um, growing out of the ant. So this shows in insects at least that microbes can control the central nervous system, can control the behavior uh, of an insect. But that doesn't only happen in insects, it can happen in animals as well. So if a mouse becomes infected uh, with this microbe known as Toxoplasma gondii, uh, a very intriguing thing happens. This mice loses its fear of cats. So this uh, microbe um, can make its way into a mouse and, and change the, the behavior, can change the brain um, of this mammal. Uh, unfortunately, what usually happens is the mouse ends up as, as dinner for the cats. So, these microbes can change the, the brain and the behavior of insects and of mammals. Um, is that happening in humans as well? Do our gut microbes change uh, our brain and change our, our behavior? Well, we have some evidence for that. Um, in that one in three people who report symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome also report symptoms of anxiety and depression. That is a huge co-occurrence of gut issues with mental health issues, suggesting that there may be some pathways that are shared between poor gut health uh, and poor brain health. So how might that be working? How could the gut maybe be connected with the brain? Well, recent evidence shows us that there are a number of exciting pathways that connect the gut with the brain. I've spoken to you about the peripheral nervous system and the fact that we have 500 million neurons in the gut which are connected to the brain. One of the very important parts of this peripheral nervous system is known as the vagus nerve. This is a really big nerve that connects the gut uh, with the brain and sends messages in both directions. Secondly, we have the immune system, which I've talked about already. 70% of the immune system roughly is located in our gut. Uh, and our brain is uh, very susceptible to changes in inflammation and the immune system. So anything that's coming into our gut is um, checked and screened by our immune system. And if um, there is an invader, the immune system will trigger inflammation, which if occurs over a long period of time can trigger inflammation in the brain as well. Thirdly, we have neurotransmitters, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But neurotransmitters are these uh, chemicals which work in the brain. And these include things like serotonin and dopamine. And actually what's been discovered is a huge number of these uh, neurotransmitters are actually produced in the gut as well as being produced in the brain. In fact, about 90% of the serotonin that's, uh, that's made in your body is actually made in your gut. Uh, and most of that does not make its way into the brain but has its own function in the gut as well, a huge number of functions. And finally, because we have all these thousands of different types of microbes living inside of our gut, uh, they can produce a, an even greater number of different metabolites and proteins and different chemicals, which can pass their way, uh, some of which can pass their way into your brain, or at least make their way to the blood brain barrier uh, and cause uh, changes in, in the brain function and, and the, the function of these neurons. So if we look at how that works here, we can see that the gut and the brain are connected through this uh, peripheral nervous system, mainly through uh, what is known as the vagus nerve, but also many, many other, other nerves. And if we look back at this gut barrier again here, we can see exactly how that works. These nerves are connected somewhat to the, uh, the cells within the gut barrier. Uh, the gut microbes can signal and send messages to those cells, which then subsequently send messages to the per peripheral nervous system and into the brain and the central nervous system. And so I've mentioned that the gut microbes do this by producing things like neurotransmitters, including serotonin, GABA, dopamine, some of these neurotransmitters that you might have heard of. The microbes can help send these uh, electrical signals from the gut uh, to the brain. They can also regulate inflammation and immune function in the gut. 
And finally, they can also produce these really interesting metabolites, for example, short chain fatty acids or EPS, some of these really interesting compounds which are produced uh, only by bacteria, uh, but have a function in the brain. So what is the evidence that uh, th this actually works either in humans or in, in the lab in animals? Well, I've told you before that uh, diversity is a good marker of uh, microbiome health. And this study from Ireland a few years ago showed that people with major depression, uh, major clinically diagnosed depression, had significantly lower um, gut microbiome diversity. If you take the gut microbiome from these people and place them into an experimental mouse in a, in a lab study, intriguingly, these mice show anxiety-like behavior. So again, this is only in, in mice, but it shows that there may be some sort of um, brain phenotype that could be passed from uh, humans uh, into experimental animals through the, the gut microbiome alone. And in humans, there's evidence that suggests that um, this gut-brain axis is real as well. As I said to you before, uh, IBS is, is very commonly occurs along with anxiety or depressive-like symptoms. And so even targeting the brain can have beneficial impacts for the gut. This study showed that uh, providing participants with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a form of psychological um, therapy, that significantly improved people's symptoms of IBS. So by targeting the brain and psychology, you can actually improve your, your gut symptoms as well, suggesting that this axis between the gut and the brain works uh, in both ways. Uh, and finally, uh, it, it works in the other direction, whereby uh, if you target the gut microbiome, you may be able to improve um, uh, brain health as well. And I know Kirsten is going to talk in, in a lot more detail about this. But this study found that if you feed people a prebiotic, which is usually a type of fiber, which stimulates the growth of healthy microbes in the gut, that can actually reduce the production of cortisol, which is the hormone which makes us feel stressed. So there are a number of ways potentially in the future that we'll be able to target the brain in order to improve gut health. Uh, and in this sense, target the gut in order to improve brain health as well. Uh, and I know that, um, Kirsten will, will talk a little bit more about those uh, nutritional uh, interventions as well. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you ever so much for that really engaging introduction to our bellies, bugs and brains, Rory. Um, I think it was really nice to wrap up towards the end with kind of the examples of how the brain can communicate with the gut and the gut can communicate with the brain and, and putting that into context as dietitians and nutritionists, thinking about how you can use cognitive behavioral therapy to influence you know, gut symptoms, but also then how we can use nutritional modulation, which obviously Kirsten is going to go into. We've had a couple of questions submitted. So if I can just start with asking one that says, hi Rory, great presentation. With gene sequencing research of microbiome, how far do you think we may be able to understand the function of these microbes and health outcomes? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I touched on it a little bit. Um, that reading the, the functionality of our microbiome will be able to tell us a lot more. And we're, we're able to do that right now, and it's done very routinely in scientific studies. It's not done so much in commercial microbiome sequencing. So if anyone's ever sent off their stool sample to one of these companies, usually they use a slightly older form of um, gene sequencing to just tell you what microbes are there, but not what they're doing. So that Analogy I like to give on that is that it's like asking how good a football team is if you just list the number of um, strikers, defenders, midfielders that are there. That won't tell you how good the team is, but if you can find out what function they have, how good they are at passing, at shooting, at, at tackling, that will tell you much more about how good the team is uh, and, and how healthy they are. And that's the same as our, our gut microbiome. We can learn a little bit by knowing what microbes are in there, but we know so much more if we uh, can read what they're doing, how they produce vitamins, how they digest different uh, different nutrients. So we can we we can do it uh, very easily right now in in scientific labs, but it's not done routinely in um, commercial companies. But I would imagine it is going to become way way more common uh, in the coming very very soon in the next year or so. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we had another question. What do you think the risks and benefits of fecal transplants are? 
Yeah, it's a good question. So fecal transplants are, are kind of the really exciting area or really exciting kind of intervention in this field. At the moment, they're only indicated uh, for people that have what's known as recurrent C. diff infections. This is a, a horrible infection you usually pick up in hospitals and most often happens in older people. That's the only reason that it should be given right now in hospitals, um, only because that's the only thing that it has evidence for. However, it has been trialed in um, severe obesity, metabolic syndrome, um, you know, IBD, uh, various other things. The evidence for it in in metabolic health, so obesity and diabetes isn't very good at the moment. And that's probably because there is a huge number of other factors that, that would need to be taken into account. If it is going to work, I'd imagine that um, a fecal transplant plus some sort of dietary intervention might be most beneficial. Um, so that is one for further down the line probably. Um, but right now uh, it is unsafe uh, to do other than if you have a recurrence C. diff infection. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've got two questions I'll combine. Uh, one is about, uh, is certain bacteria associated with individuals who are underweight? Um, but uh, and also another question is, do you think that the microbiome can cause obesity or more of an effect, or do you think it's a mix of both? So I guess it's about um, how does the microbiome influence, or is there differences if you're underweight, overweight, and does it have a role to play? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's definitely a role of the microbiome on the other side of the spectrum as well. Uh, although there's less evidence in underweight, um, th there is a little bit to show that you tend to have a more accumulation of microbes which, which eat away at this mucosal barrier because they themselves are essentially a little bit starved. And so they start um, consuming some of that um, mucus that is around the, um, on that epithelial barrier. Uh, that's kind of all we know in, in adults who are underweight. There's, there's a lot more in, in child undernutrition as well, which I, I won't go into right now. Um, the second part of the question was, yes, cause and effect uh, of, of the gut microbiome. Absolutely. This is, this is a very, very kind of messy field. If you kind of have a certain diet, you're of course going to have a different microbiome. If you um, have a different microbiome, you may have a, a, a different weight. So it's very hard to distinguish between these two things. My guess is, as with anything, it's a bit of both. I think there are, and there is good evidence that there's certain microbiome profiles or certain bacteria which are better at extracting energy from food and, and therefore better at uh, leading you to, to store more weight. Um, however, as we all know, um, weight gain uh, and nutrition in general has a huge number of other factors to it other than just the microbiome. So I, I view the microbiome as one part of a complex puzzle in nutrition. And although we get excited about it, there are a huge number of other factors uh, at play as well. Brilliant. We have loads of questions coming in and we haven't quite got the time to go through all of them. So what I'm going to do is move on to the next speaker. Rory, please feel free to have a look at the Q&A box and answer some of them if you can do, but also we might have time to answer, answer some at the end, or you can go through and answer a few more later. I know you are happy to have a look at the, the Q&A box and, and go back to people, so thank you. Great. In the do. meantime, thank you ever so much. In the meantime, let's move on. Next up, we have Dr. Kirsten Birding Harold. Um, Dr. Kirsten Birding Harold is a postdoctoral researcher at the APC Microbiome Island in the University College Cork, working with Professor John Cryan and Professor Ted Dynan. She holds a PhD in nutritional sciences from the University of Illinois. She's a, a dietitian herself and her interest, her research interests focus on how diet can modulate the gut microbiota health interaction. She's going to be focusing on the role of nutrition and the role nutrition has to play within the microbiota gut brain axis with her talk titled Nutritional Modulation of the Microbiota Gut Brain Axis, Role of Diet in Cognition, Mood and Mental Health. So please feel free to uh, pop your slides up and I will hand over to you. Perfect. I will share this now and I'll actually also, good. great, put on my laser pointer over to and you. just minimize the videos over here. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Luis, for the introduction and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. I'm very excited to, to share my research and others, others' research today really on, on how we can use nutrition um, and other approaches to modulate the microbiota gut brain axis. And Rory has given such a great overview uh, of the signaling between the microbiota and the brain that I really don't have to go into too much detail. Um, the only thing I do want to point out, and it 
it came up a little bit in the questions as well is that although we know that um, there's a lot of species there, a lot of different microbes, and we also know all the, the genes that are there and that they outnumber us, there actually is still quite a bit of unknown about the microbiota. So there is still some bacteria that, that are there that we don't know who they are. And importantly, also there's some functional unknowns. So this was a couple of years ago, but there's about 40% of the genes actually that are in the microbiome that we don't know yet what they do. So with um, advances in this technology and with advances in understanding what the microbiome does, there also will be more uh, knowledge just about how the gut and the brain communicate to each other. But what I really want to focus on is what we call psychobiotic therapies. And Rory has given such a great kind of gateway into my, um, in, into my presentation. And so when we talk about psychobiotics, really um, what we think about are factors that can influence the microbiota and that, are bacteria, that bacteria mediate positive effects on mental health. And this term psychobiotics was um, coined by my mentors, Ted Dynan and John Krein a couple of years ago. And first, when we thought about psychobiotics, we really thought mostly about probiotics. So those live microorganisms that we can ingest and that will have an effect on our mental health potentially. But now there's other exogenous factors, so including prebiotics as well as diet that could potentially fall under this umbrella term of psychobiotics. And recently, this was summarized in a really nice review um, that there's different uh, therapies available. So the ones I talked over here, the probiotics, prebiotics, a combination of the two, which is uh, referred to as symbiotics, but also potentially some foods. So fermented foods, which I will talk about as well, um, could fall into the whole area of psychobiotic therapies. And so firstly, what I'd like to give an overview of are these three elements of psychobiotic therapies before I move more into how we can use diet as a modulator as well. So like I said, the probiotics, and I'm sure you've seen loads of these in, in the stores, in the grocery stores, um, these are live organisms that confer health benefit if they are administered in adequate amounts. And then on the other hand, we have the prebiotics, so the food for the microbes that um, increase mostly the beneficial microbes and again have a health benefit. And both of these have shown in humans and animal studies that there's a positive effect on stress levels. So as uh, Rory was pointing out, the one study where there was a decrease in the perceived stress as well as in the cortisol hormone. hormone. There is evidence that it can also improve mood. So there might be some evidence um, for being used in um, patients, for example, with depression and also emerging evidence showing that these pro and prebiotics can actually affect cognitive function. And if I go into a little bit more detail, so mostly probiotic, the probiotics that have been studies, uh, studied are the bifidobacterium and the lactobacillus strain. So those are the most, mostly where we have the evidence for now. And again, we can see that there is this, this positive effect on different aspects of mental health as well as cognition. There's also not increased interest in looking at a combination of different microbes. So sometimes um, using a single strain might not elicit the effect. And as Rory is saying, we live in an ecosystem, so there's a variety of different microbes. So combining different microbes can actually also, is also of, of interest in, in our research area now. And again, some benefits have been shown uh, specifically in this one, a decrease in depression severity, again, in patients with, ma with major depressive disorder. On the other hand, we do see the prebiotics, so feeding the microbes that are already there. Um, and these are all very fermentable fibers. Mostly, the mostly studied ones are fructooligosaccharides and galactooligosaccharides. Um, and so these studies are with supplementation prebiotics. And of course, as you, you know, there's a lot of fruits and vegetables that are also very high in these prebiotic fibers that could also elicit similar effects. Um, but just looking at the supplementation on its own, again, we see that they, there could be decrease in anxiety, decrease in some depressing like behaviors, as well as some influence on cognition, um, such as attention or cognitive flexibility. And so overall, taking all these studies that have been published on pro prebiotics, there's very promising, promising evidence that there is a psychological effect of these compounds 
on the microbiome and brain health. And um, that it might be the potential of using it, it as add-on treatments in psychiatric diseases. There's not enough evidence as using it as single approaches yet. Um, and this mostly stems also from uh, most of the research being done to date in healthy populations. So there's a need to move more into clinical populations and really understand how these um, pre-probiotics pre could potentially um, alleviate some of the symptoms. The other uh, potential psychobiotic therapy that's, that's it's more of interest now are fermented foods. And I'm sure you have all have had fermented foods and you know of fermented foods. And actually, when we look at the literature, there's about 5,000 varieties of fermented foods that are consumed around the world. I would say in the Western world or in Ireland and potentially the UK as well, mostly we probably eat yogurt, maybe a little bit kombucha or kefir. Those are probably the most prominent ones. But in some of the maybe more the Asian countries, of course, kimchi, miso soup and tempeh. And of course, the, the whole idea of fermented foods is not really new. It has been used over centuries for, um, as a way of preserve, preserving food. And even the effect on health is not that new. So already back in the late 18th, early 19th century, Ilan Mechnikov has observed that in Bulgarian farmers, that they live a lot longer and a lot more healthy. And he associated this health and longevity with the consumption of fermented foods. And so since then, more and more, we, we understand how the fermented foods impact, impact our health. And in a very recent study, it was shown that if you eat a lot of fermented foods, and actually in this, this particular study, it was six servings of fermented foods per day, which I think it is quite high. Um, but just to show you that it was a very high extreme fermented food diet. But it did show that um, it increased the diversity. And as we are saying, this is one of the markers of a potential healthy microbiota. And it also showed decreased inflammatory signals. And we know that inflammation is associated with chronic disease. Um, so by decreasing the inflammatory status through a high fermented food diet, we could potentially also decrease the risk of developing some of these chronic diseases, such as diabetes, cancer, or cardiovascular disease. When it comes to brain health, um, the, the evidence is a little slimmer, but we do again see from animal models and a couple of human studies that there might be prom that, that fermented foods might hold promise as a psychobiotic agent. Um, so specifically some you know, autism spectrum disorders, which is a, a, a research area of high interest, um, trying to develop new therapies for affected children and adults as well. So kefir could have an effect here, um, as well as on other uh, physical symptoms of stress or brain activity. So some studies have shown that there might be an effect. Um, we do need more research as to um, how much we need to eat of the fermented food to really have this health effect. And so now, I, I mean, based on this question, do they all work? I'm sure you already, you already can guess the answer. Of course, no. <laughs> it's science, it works that way sometimes. Um, so this was another study when looking at a probiotic intervention, the lactobacillus rhamnosus, which did show very, very promising results in a preclinical model, actually showed no effect in this population whatsoever. Um, so there was no effect in the cognition aspect, which was a memory task here, no effect on the perceived stress scale, and no effect on the immune responses. So there could be different explanations as to why this is. Um, on the one hand, it could be a healthy population. And I hinted at this a little bit before that a lot of these studies to date are being done in healthy populations. So expecting to see a um, really big response, or a new anti-inflammatory response in a population that overall is, has no inflamed status, um, that, you know, that could not, that would be a, um, a ceiling effect. And similar to you know, normal or healthy people having low, low levels of stress and already um, good cognition, uh, you might not actually see a difference there. It also could be the issue of the single strain, as I was talked, uh, talked previously about, that they are now, or we are now interested in combining those different probiotics or a lack of colonization so that the microbes actually not um, inhabit or they, they actually don't become part of the, the resident microbiota. And, that might be another explanation as to why there's no effect. 
and so that that and one thing of course is the combination of different strains but then also a combination of different approaches and so what i'm very interested in is the approach of combining different um psychobiotic therapies so for example in this trial it was shown that using a probiotic together with a diet and in this case it was a hypocaloric diet actually showed a stronger effect on decreasing anxiety in this population so you can see this bar over here is a lot larger showing that the combined effect of the two um, two interventions had a bigger effect and so when I talk about diet in the brain, I'm sure you've all heard about the good food is good for mood. And there's, there's now extensive ob observational data showing that across different countries and cultures. So when we talk about the Mediterranean diet or the Norwegian diet or the Japanese diet, that all of these have been linked to um, reduced mental uh, risk of developing mental diseases as well as improved cognitive performance. And there's also now a shift into trying to get um, different intervention and randomized trials to really improve um, dietary habits and improve mental health um, diseases. On the other hand, of course, we also know that the Western diet has been linked to very, very much poor health, mental health outcomes, impair cognitive function, as well as an increased risk of developing anxiety, depression, and other mental illnesses. So, a lot of what the research now is focusing on is, is really understanding the mechanisms. So we know that there's this interaction, but what are the mechanisms? And we cannot deny that there's a direct effect of some of these diet, dietary components on the brain. But what we are very, very interested in is does the microbiota mediate this effect of diet on the brain? And I will outline some of the arguments as to why that the answer to this question is yes um, in the next couple of slides. The first thing I want to point out, and I'm sure most of you know this, is that some of the nutrients we eat, so including dietary fiber and polyphenols, actually cannot be digested by the human enzymes. So we do need the microbiota to make these nutrients bioavailable. So that would kind of be the first hint at the need of the microbiota in this diet-brain relationship. And uh, we have recently summarized um, a lot of this evidence in the review article. So if you're interested in reading more about um, what I'm talking about next, this would, be, um, this would be the citation for that. And others have also already started to really look at, can we use diet to feed those sad microbes and make them happy and also then make the host happy? So the first, the first argument as to why I th we think the microbiota is involved in this relationship is this big factor of or the big influence diet has on the microbiota composition. Um, Rory has said that there's different factors that influence the microbiota, including where you live, your exercise level, your age, but diet still is one of the most, um, or is also one of the most easily accessible targets um, as to how you can change the microbiota. And on the one hand, so there's both positive and negative factors, of course. Thinking about the negative factors, so all these um, unhealthy dietary patterns, the Western diets, eating a lot of sweetness and emulsifiers, there's a specific effect that all of these patterns and nutrients have. But just in general speaking, if you think about the negative effect of these unhealthy patterns, generally speaking, you would see a decrease in the health-promoting bacteria and their products, such as the short-chain fatty acids that were previously mentioned, potentially maybe an increase in some of the more pathogenic or harmful bacteria and a lower diversity. And this whole interaction between unhealthy diet and, and um, the microbiome has really been studied in large populations, um, population studies, um, specifically in this one comparing populations that live in um, more agricultural countries. So this would be in Africa and in South America versus people who live in an industrialized nation. So specifically here was the United States. And if you look at these two um, lines over here, each of these, these lines um, represents a different microbe. So the first thing that you can see is that there's a lot more lines in this green box up here compared to the red box. So that means there's a lot more microbes present in, this, in these uh, people. And uh, so they have a higher diversity. And the other thing you can see is that the darker the color is over here, that means that there's actually more of this specific microbe present. So the microbes over here on the right-hand side, they, they are present in higher concentrations in people in the United States when compared to people from South America or, um, or the African con continent. 
And so there's two kind of thoughts that, um, that could um, elicit this, this, these differences. One is of course the added detriments, like I was talking about the emulsifiers and the sugars, and then of course the missing benefits. So not eating enough fiber or polyphenols um, in general. But what is very interesting is also that this loss of diversity can actually be brought, or can actually given to the next generations. And this has been shown both in animals and human studies. So in this specific study, when feeding a low fiber diet to the first generation and then looking at the microbiota over the different gen or the next two generations, you actually see that there's an increased loss in diversity and it's not being able to be recovered, even if you then feed a high fiber diet to generation two and three. In humans, of course, studying multiple generations, such a longitudinal study would be impossible and take a very long time. Um, but we can, for example, look at our great grandparents and grandparents and, and our parents and compare the diversity of our microbes, microbiomes um, to them. And this was done in another study looking um, at the immigration pattern from countries, again, from more the South American continent to the United States. And again, when comparing those um, pre-immigration microbiome patterns to the ones that newly arrived and then were long-term residents and lived in the United States for longer, again, we do see that there's this decrease in diversity and specifically decrease in some of these fiber degrading enzymes. And what really, might be the implications of this, is that this could be linked to the increase in chronic diseases. Um, so specifically, of course, for us of interest with the microbiota gut brain axis are the neurological and psychiatric diseases. And so this really gives some, some pretty convincing evidence that there is this connection between diet, a loss of microbial diversity, and an increase in some of these chronic diseases that we see in Western worlds. And so when we then, of course, um, with the negative effect, we also will have the positive effect. So when we think about all these healthy diets, the Mediterranean diets, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, um, including fermented foods, again, there's specific effects that are included with each of these foods and how it affects the microbiota. But just very generally speaking, we can mostly observe that there's a higher diversity with healthier diets, increase in these beneficial bacteria in their products, and then a decrease in the harmful bacteria. So kind of the opposite of what you would um, observe with the um, unhealthy dietary foods. And so this is all nice. There's, a, there's this combination of this direct effect of diet on the microbiota, but how does this really relate to the brain? And so some of the, the most convincing evidence that has come has of course come from animal models. A lot of times it's easier to study these effects um, in animals. And one of, the, um, one of the approaches that can be used is um, what, we, what previous was, previously was mentioned using the fecal microbial transfer. So transferring a microbiome from one animal to the next animal. And in, without going into too much detail, but in both of these studies, what was done is that the donor animal was fed a specific diet. On the one hand, it was a high fat diet. On the other hand, it was the ketogenic diet. The microbiota that resulted from that specific diet was transferred to a new recipient animal. And in both of these studies, it was not only shown that the microbiota was similar from the donor and the recipient, but you actually also saw that without feeding the diet to the recipient animal, these animals also showed the same um, behavior than the, anim the, the donor animal did that actually did eat the diet. So this really shows that diet changes something in the microbiota, changes the composition and the function that then without the diet being present, you can actually see similar behavioral eff effects. Um, another approach is um, you can use or that has been used is antibiotics. So wiping out the microbiota to see whether or not um, the microbes are necessary for the effect of the diet. And again, in this specific study, when wiping out the microbiota using anti an antibiotic cocktail, both the positive effect of what they call microbiota excessive carbohydrates, which really is just a fancy word for, for fiber that the microbes can digest. Um, by wiping these, these microbes out, we did not see the positive effect on inflammation and um, memory. Again, suggesting that the microbiota really is needed for this effect of diet on the brain. And of course, this is great. This is animal data, but we also want to have human data to really understand if, if this is um, 
in fact happening. Um, it's a lot more difficult to do these type of studies in humans. We talked about the difficulty with fecal microbial transplant and actually giving a large, broad, broad spectrum antibiotic to a healthy population uh, is, is not, we will probably won't get a lot of um, volunteers for that. But what we can do is really focusing on nutrition education programs that really target the microbiota. So in this specific study using dietary fiber and fermented foods and um, educating a more obese population um, on the, to eat the increase the consumption of these foods, there was, they showed that there was an increase in this diversity that now we have established is the whole, uh, a kind of like a marker of a healthy microbiome as well as some beneficial microbes. And just overall with the well-being, um, there was increase in the subjective well-being as well as a decrease in the depression score. Um, another study that was recently um, published looked at the Mediterranean diet, which we all know is associated with overall health. And again, just by looking at these microbes that increased in the concentration after the diet and correlating those with some of the other health outcomes, it was shown that these microbes specifically were linked with reduced frailty, improved cognitive function and reduced inflammation in an elderly population. So in humans, you, you can still get some correlational data by looking at a dietary intervention and together with really sophisticated statistical, statistical approaches, you can look at some of these um, triangular relationships between diet, microbiota and the brain. And so we were also very interested recently um, as my mentors, um, Ted Dunn and John Cryan looked at the psychobiotic, coined the term psychobiotic. We were wanted to see, can we develop a psychobiotic diet influence the signaling between the microbiome and the brain and influence stress responses in an adult population. And so in this particular study, we educated a group of people to follow a, the psychobiotic diet for four weeks. And just very broadly speaking, they were instructed to increase the intake of fruits and vegetables, grains, legumes, and fermented foods, so the more microbiota-friendly foods, and decrease the consumption of unhealthy foods. And by looking at the data, I'm not showing it here, but we actually did see that they followed this, these instructions very well. And when we look at some of the health outcomes, the first thing that we were, thought was interesting is that they actually went from being really constipated to having this normal stool consistency and having more regular bowel habits. Um, and this also translated into being uh, participants being more satisfied with the bowel habits after the intervention. And what we very, were very excited about is that actually by following this diet, we also saw that, that the, these participants felt a lot less stressed after the intervention. So they had a lot lower stress scores on the scale that we used. And specifically, what's also interesting is that participants who adhered more closely to the guidelines actually even had lower scores on the stress scale. Um, and what was also surprising to us, um, what we um, what we looked in kind of more an exploratory analysis is that also we saw this uh, improvement in sleep quality. So there is the connection between the microbiome and sleep as well. Um, but we actually also saw that following this diet, we could improve the sleep of these participants as well. So we are still looking at some of the biological analysis and Unfortunately, I can't show any of the microbiome data today, but we also see we're just um, consistent with some of the um, results from the literature that there might be an increase in some of these healthy bacteria and some of the products that they produce. So we're very excited and looking more into this, this detail in, in more detail and hopefully we have some results out um, by the end of the fall. And so the last couple of things I want to just briefly touch on, and uh, Rory's already done so, is this, this idea of a personalized approach and that each individual has a personalized microbiome and will respond differently to a dietary intervention. And so this can, is due to different aspects of the baseline microbiota is uh, what we call it. So this could be specific bacteria, a group of bacteria, all those enterotypes that were previously mentioned as well as gene richness or functional capacity. And if you think about this, it does, it, it does make sense. So if you have different enterotypes and all of these different bacteria have different substrates that they use, you might have, you know, if you have an enterotype that's really rich in what is called the Escherichia, for example, they're not able to ferment dietary fiber. They would strive on different foods. So feeding these people high, uh, high foods and vegetable, high dietary fiber might not change their microbiota and not produce these positive um, 
uh, products such as Georgian fatty acids. So in this case, you might actually need a combined approach, um, actually kind of, you know, combining it with potentially fer uh, feeding fermented foods or probiotics to introduce some of these new, bac new bacteria. And uh, Rory has showed the, the whole um, response with your microbiome and the glucose response. And it was similar in this intervention study using a whole wheat um, bread intervention in a population. They actually were able to show that these people who had the high ratio of Prevotella to Bacteroides, they were able to include, improve their glucose metabolism. Whereas those who had a low ratio in these two bacteria, they did not see any change. And so just as a kind of take home message to summarize um, the psychobiotics and how we can potentially modulate the, the gut brain axis, it's really different approaches. And I do think that it was touched on that it might be a combination of different approaches that will, be, will need to be used at some point. Um, and what I think, what I, for me personally, also as a dietitian is not just to kind of develop therapies for psychological diseases. So including diet as a way of, um, for treat, as a standard of care for these patients, but also potentially influence eating guidelines and nutrition policies to really, what we say, mine our microbes and bring back the, the healthy diversity and the healthy microbes that we might be missing with the consumption of these really unhealthy westernized diets. And uh, like Rory was saying, there will be this, this move in the per, per, potentially distant future, but this personally, therapy approach to really look at different microbiota targeted approaches. And the more we get the, the availability and the price, um, the price down and the availability up to really look at what does the microbiome look like of a specific patient or client, can we really then develop a personalized nutrition and microbiome therapy based on this um, the baseline microbiome? So maybe one person just needs the medication, another person might only need the inter nutrition intervention, and there might then be a combination in other people. So I think this is a very exciting outlook and something that um, we will definitely go to work towards, I think, in the future. Um, and so I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and if I don't get to your question, you can always email me or also um, follow me on Twitter or message me on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Kirsten. We've had lots of questions coming in and Rory has been doing a great job of uh, answering a lot of them for us. So I'm just going to try and pick up some of the common themes um, of questions and then a couple of specific ones as well. So one was around um, using prebiotic foods and the issue that a lot of patients might have in terms of if they're trying to follow a low FODMAP diet um, and issues there. So what's your advice around if if someone has perhaps sensitive gut and actually you're trying to introduce prebiotic foods? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to say. It will be very personalized. So a lot of these, the results that I have shown are from healthy populations. And that's, that I was trying to get that across is that in people or in patients who might have IBS or have other gut sensitivity issues, I think it, it might look, it will look different um, to what you would suggest them to eat. Um, so of course, you know, if they can't tolerate these foods, then there's no point in, in ex, you know, telling them to eat these foods. I think then there would be different approaches that need to be taken. Um, so it's difficult at this point to make generalized statements. So most of these statements would be for healthy, healthy populations. Lovely. Thank you. And what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting and its potential to improve the health or diversity of the gut microbiome? Yes, this is an, it's an up and coming um, research. It's a very exciting, I think, approach as well. And I think there was recently a study showing that the microbiota is mediating some of these effects of intermittent fasting. Um, I know from, per I have people in my personal um, surroundings that are using intermittent fasting as a way to improve their health and it does, it does work. Um, I think again, that, that more research needs to be kind of done in that area, but it's, it's another really exciting um, approach, I think, that, that could potentially be used in the future. A really uh, uh, a nice question, but it's a bit negative. Is the future generation doomed with poor gut health if more people are currently not kept taking care of their gut microbiome? It, it is a very negative question, but I mean, that's what the research points to, I think. It is very important for us, um, and I've, Rory is doing more research in this area, but also like looking at maternal health and you actually, you know, you're transferring the microbiota to, to the baby. And so it's very important to really mine your microbes early on. And um, that's what I was, I was trying to 
get at is to really, can we change nutrition policies and guidelines that we don't see a further de de decrease in this diversity? So it is a very negative outlook, but I think there's things that can be done and every, every person can do it. So, you know, you, if you want to, you know, eat a healthier diet, eat all these fibers and everything, I think you can um, already do something for your generations. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more that needs to be done to really get a, a global health effect, I think. Lovely. Like I said, there are lots of questions in, in the, the Q&A box. So feel free afterwards if you want, Kirsten and Roy, just to have a look at it for a few minutes um, before we wrap up. But I'll just ask one last question to both of you then that's just come in, actually. And it's about how would you advise the inclusion of fermented foods and probiotic foods? Like how often a week? Um, so sort of what's your kind of practical take home message in terms of how we should improve our diets to better our, our gut microbiome and our gut health? So perhaps Kirsten, you go first. Sure. So especially with fermented foods, I the study I was mentioning, they ate six servings of fermented food. So it was, I think, 250 milliliters of like kefir or kombucha six times a day. Um, so we really don't know yet what um, what the dose would be that, that we really need. Um, and similarly, uh, we also don't know which products are the best. So sometimes with the, some of the commercial products that are available, you might not have the same um, part of probiotic bacteria and everything in there that you might see if you do it, you know, if you do your own fermentation at home. So at this point, I would say a, a diverse diet, potentially maybe two to three servings of fermented foods a day. And then of course, meeting recommendations for the fiber intake. A lot of diversity in the fruits and vegetables um, are important, including some seeds, legumes, nuts. So they all have all these different diverse foods will have different prebiotic fibers that will feed different microbes. So I think this is a, at this point what perhaps the, the best advice could be um, in regards to this. Rory, did you want to add anything? I did. Yeah. I was thinking, God, six times a day. I didn't know. Do you mean six times a week there? I was thinking, God, that's a, I have to try and fit, uh, up my intake. <laughs> um, no, no. In terms of kind of take home tips, uh, the one I usually come back to for people is, in order to try and increase that diversity, if ever you're doing a food shop, try and buy a new uh, plant-based food that you don't usually buy. I mean, we're all guilty of going in and like, I'll oh, just buy the peppers and the onions or, or whatever you usually get. But force yourself to buy something new every time. And that'll help you to work up to this, what's kind of proposed is this magic number of 30 different plant-based foods a week. I mean, it's not uh, based on that much evidence, but it's a good a good number to, to target for. And that can include a different fruit, vegetable, nuts, seeds, spices, um, and, and to try and kind of work your way up to, to different types of foods. Um, other practical things you could do are kind of chop up lots of, lots of different nuts and seeds and put them in a, in a jar in your kitchen and sprinkle them on cereal, on salads. That's a great way to add up to that 30. Um, don't just rely on white uh, pasta or white rice as your kind of carbohydrate intake go not only for the brown versions but there's so many different grains available to us these days you go into any tesco or anything you can get quinoa bulgur wheat um all these other types of grains pearl barley and everything that that many of us don't eat enough of so um yeah they're my kind of take home tips for people brilliant Thank you ever so much to both of you. Apologies to all the attendees if we didn't get a chance to put your questions to the speakers. But like I said, Rory and Kirsten are going to have a quick look and see if they can answer any quickly. Just give them a couple of minutes, but we won't expect them to stay on much longer than that on a, on a hot, sunny day like today. Um, as I mentioned, the session has been recorded. So once we've uh, got it ready, we'll send it out to you. Give me a day or two, perhaps. A short evaluation survey will pop up just after the webinar as well, and we'd be grateful for any feedback. Um, but that really just leaves me time to say a huge thank you to both Rory and Kirsten for their really fascinating talks, for answering all the questions and for agreeing to just answer a couple more as well in, in their spare time afterwards as well. Um, I think we've really learned a lot from you and uh, really been able to think about how nutrition has a role to play. And I hope everyone listening has found it as fascinating as I have as well. So thank you all for joining. Thank you, our speakers. And I hope you all have a lovely evening.